If I present to you, the viewer, this silhouetted profile, some of you are probably going, wow, that's kind of a mess and I'm not really sure how to interpret that. But some of you may be saying, I think I may have seen that guy on Toonami once. Some of you may be saying, I think I saw him in a Zelda comic once. Still others may be saying, I think I saw him on the cover of a wacky PS1 game at a blockbuster that I did not rent. And you mecha enthusiasts may be considering getting some pizza for dinner tonight. And now you're probably all thinking, wait a minute, all of these different characters from different forms of media all look the same. Is there some kind of connection? Well? Yeah. Hello. I wasted the past 15 years of my life researching this extremely specific topic, and now I'm here bringing my findings to you. I'll show you how a character design concept from 1940s Japan went on to influence character designs around the globe up to the present day. So sit back and enjoy while I present to you The Design History of the Pointy Nose Cyborg, a visual representation of love, tribute, and inspiration. Before we begin, want to get this out of the way, there's varying degrees of spoilers for the following series. Cyborg 009, Gal Guy Gar, Silhouette, Mirage, Metropolis, God of High School, Disgaea, Violinist, of Hamlin, Deltarune, Chapter 2. <sighs> With that out of the way, let's dive right into post-World War II Japan. Like most Japanese anime-centric history topics, this one starts with Osamu Tezuka. You probably already know him as the creator of Astro Boy and The Lion King, so I'm not going to dive too deep into it, there's plenty of other videos out there that already do that. After the end of World War II, Tezuka wanted to lift the spirits of the children of Japan by creating comic books for kids to enjoy. He told all kinds of stories, some original stories and some retellings of existing stories. One such story is his one-shot manga, Metropolis. That's right, Metropolis, the German silent film masterpiece. Well, actually, Tezuka himself admitted that he never actually saw Metropolis, Metropolis, he'd only seen a single shot of it in a magazine and went, got it. Because aside from the name and the existence of a robot, that's kind of where the similarities end. Tesco released the Metropolis manga in 1949. The main protagonist in Metropolis, in this iteration anyway, are a Japanese detective and his nephew visiting some vaguely European or American megacity. But Tesco needs a villain for this story, and that's where we have our first one. This villain needs to have a decidedly Western appearance, with a pronounced chin, nose, and slicked back hair. This leaves him with a striking bird-like profile. Striking, for sure, not quite iconic though, not yet anyway. No, this will not be the character design that goes on to inspire many. But don't worry, we'll get there. This particular character's name is Duke Red. He's a highly dignified villainous jackass that ends up getting his just desserts. But more importantly, he would go on to be a major star in Tezuka's star system. In this star system, Tezuka treats his characters as if they were actors, where he uses characters as different roles in his stories. He even has Duke Red play as Cyrano de Bergerac, famously Big Nose Duelist, the first science fiction author in the world, and inventor of the Ram Jet did I stutter? But the story of this character design does not end with Tezuka, and with that, let's continue into the future. One of Tezuka's fans turned assistants was the legendary Shotaro Ishinomori. And if Tezuka is the god of manga, Ishinomori is the king of manga. He's currently the world record holder for most published comic book pages in one artist's lifetime. So of course at some point or another he had to have an extra wacky character design. After traveling the world and reading a bunch of science fiction novels, he was inspired to write the story of an international team of humans who were kidnapped from their daily lives and forcefully turned into cybernetic weapons of war. Ishinomori was an avid film buff who combined his love of film film with his character designs. For the American character who goes by the number 002, he considered names like Jim, Hank, and Jet. And if you're thinking to yourself, hey, those are all names of James Dean characters. First of all, impressive. Second, yes. After consuming West Side Story and a bunch of James Dean movies, Ishinomori combined the story of the Jets gang of New York City with the whole vibe of James Dean. <laughs> even naming this American character after Dean's character Jet Rink from the 1956 film Giant. What's this about Jet Rink? As for the actual design of the character, well, we actually got a little bit of insight into how 002 and the main character 009's designs branched off of each other, 009 becoming the blueprint for every shonen protagonist, and 002 borrowing heavily from the theory behind Duke Red's design. After all, Ishinomori isn't trying to reinvent the wheel here. What he has is an international team of nine humans who all need to look unique from each other. What I think happened was he got to 002 and he thought to himself, I need to make it instantly clear to the reader that this is the 
epitome of a Western dude. An American without having to deck him out in the red, white, and blue. White American character? Give him a big nose and some swept back hair so he looks like an eagle. It also goes really well with the character's theme. He really is a bird. His particular cybernetic power are the jet engines in his legs, giving him the ability to fly, as if the men in black that abducted him turned to the scientists and said, his name is Jet, do something with that. He's also particularly speedy, having the same acceleration ability that the main character has, just not as good. In terms of personality, he tends to fluctuate wildly between aggressive street punk and caring big brother type. So those are his three associations. Flight, speed, asshole. Keep those three things bookmarked in your mind because they're important as we go forward. Alright, let's be real. From this point on, I'm going to be referring to this character as Jet because it's four less syllables than 002. I could go on and on about Jet. My closest friends know that for a fact. There's nearly 60 years of content for this character, but I think I might save that for another video essay. Perhaps one where I rank all the different designs that this character has gone through. Spoilers, this is the worst one. What I will do instead is go over some of Ishinomori's iterations of this character. Yes, Ishinomori used the same star system concept that Tezuka had. Though, to be fair, most of these feel more like cameos than the character actually being treated like an actor. There's the mustachioed nameless villain from Android V, the bearded Mr. Tequila from Guy Punch, but more importantly, there's this mustachioed and bearded character from the alternate universe Cold War manga 009-1. You know how when you don't feel like renaming a file so you just iterate it by one? It's like that. This guy goes by several increasingly obvious names. In the anime, he's introduced as Mars, and in the manga, he's introduced as Agent 020, and eventually it's revealed that he's really just Jet. From here, Cyborg 009 went on to be a popular on and off again manga series, a part of Japanese pop culture, anime adaptations including a Saturday morning cartoon series in 1979, and a full length sci fi film in 1980, with even more to come in the new millennium. But let's not write Ishinomori off just yet, because something really peculiar is going to happen in the 90s, and it's only going to be the beginning. As Nintendo was gearing up for their 1991 release of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, they approached Ishinomori, now legendary mangaka, to commission him for a comic based on the game. I can only imagine Ishinomori's response was something like, Sure. On one condition. At this point, Ishinomori is in his 50s and likely not picking up the controller on his Super Famicom. I imagine a Nintendo intern orally dictating the vague plot of Link to the Past to Ishinomori as he takes likewise vague notes, because while the manga does touch on some of the key bits of the game's plot, most of it feels completely unrelated. But when he gets to the Dark World part of A Link to the Past, a corrupted version of Hyrule that turns the Hylians that wander into it into monsters reflecting their hearts, Ishinomori totally gets it. His whole thing is the act of walking a tightrope between being human and something completely other. In the game, Link is turned into a pink bunny wabbit to show that at his core, Link is a pacifist. But Ishinomori likes drama, and he must have known about all the times that Link took a few too many sword swipes to a poor defenseless chicken. In the manga, Link begins to turn into some kind of beast. Link is eventually able to stave this off by obtaining the Moon Pearl, a magical item that restores a Hylian's original form in the Dark World. And then he meets my most favorite character of anything ever. Remember when Ishinomori said, sure, on one condition? Who are you? My name is Rome. This is that condition. I challenge you for the right to wield the Master Sword. Defend yourself! What are you? Scream! That's right, Ishinomori bleached Jet's hair, gave him pointy ears, and dropped him right into one of Nintendo's most beloved and celebrated franchises. And then he turned him into a bird. You see, Rome doesn't have a moon pearl, but he can control the forces of the Dark World through sheer force of will. You can totally tell that Ishinomori had been looking for an excuse to turn Jet into a bird for a long time. The stars that had to align for this character to come into existence are exactly what makes him my favorite. And Nintendo never really canonized the character, but in Breath of the Wild, they included many references and callbacks to previous entries in the form of songs, names of lakes and mountains, and... I was King Rome Bosphoramus Hyrule. <laughs> they put a crown on his head. Rome is also probably to blame for why Rivali is such a loathsome jackass. And this is where Ashinomori's nose folk come to an end. 
Jet's story, of course, continues onwards up to the present day, as more and more Cyborg 009 adaptations and spin-offs are made. But when I said earlier that something peculiar is going to happen in the 90s, I didn't just mean Rome. Because at this particular point in history, all of the kids that grew up watching Cyborg 009 in 1979, back when it was a Saturday morning cartoon, have now grown up, and some of them have become artists and character designers in their own rights. When we grow up being inspired by something, sometimes we want to include references to those things that influenced us so long ago. And we're about to see that in action. So I'm going to take you through a handful of these cases, specifically the ones that feel like the direct descendants to this exact character design. Violinist of Hamelin is a pretty niche series, but if you do know a Violinist of Hamelin, you probably know a couple of the characters, but you probably don't know this one very obscure character that only shows up in a couple of chapters. The creator of Violinist of Hamelin is Michiaki Watanabe, who just happened to be 12 years old in 1979 during the original run of the Cyborg 009 anime series. It was apparently influential, as he includes a few different references to Cyborg 009 in Violinist of Hamelin. So when he wants to show off the power of the central character, Sizer, he has her face off against a tough royal family Sentai team. Sentai. Don't make it weird. Designing a five-character team and getting to the second born, it's easy to assume that Watanabe went, oh, like 002, and gave Guy to his distinctive appearance, most likely as a tribute, having grown up with Cyborg 009. Let's talk about Gaita. Nearly every character in Violinist of Hamlin is named after an instrument, and in case you're wondering, a Gaita is a Spanish bagpipe. A la Gaita, Fernando, for the and now you know. After an attack on his kingdom by demons leaves his queen mother dead, and he and the rest of his family gravely injured, the royal family are brought back as cyborgs and become the Holy Demon Army. Gaita himself, with his pointed nose and his long, free-flowing hair, is a fire elemental, able to produce flames from his body. I think it's pretty clear that Gaita was meant as a tribute to Cyborg 009. I could also argue that it's maybe meant as a parody? This is essentially a team of cyborg warriors with unique powers to each other, but Gaita's design is really the only one that invokes that sort of nostalgia. So I think this is more of a wink and a nod to Ishinomori. <laughs> I already did an entire video about this character. It's literally the only other video on this channel at the moment. So if you haven't seen it and you want to learn more about this guy, and trust me, you do, do yourself a favor and go check it out. Gal Gaigar, as a series, is a love letter to all mecha anime from decades past. In interviews, Gal Gaigar character designer Takahiro Kimura has said that he aims for each character to have a characteristic that's easy to associate or identify. You know, like seeing a 15 degree angle on a face and going, Cyborg bird guy. So when Kimura goes to design the four machine kings and gets to the one that's supposed to represent air travel, he harkens back to the nostalgia of Cyborg 009 and creates pizza. That's the character's name, pizza. PIZZA! And it's not just his appearance, pizza's whole vibe is jet, just evil. But he isn't just a carbon copy. When he remembers who he is, and goes back to being Soldato J, he becomes this stony-faced alien soldier type. He still has Jet's general appearance, but now he feels very much like he has his own distinct personality. But we get it, right? He's clearly a Jet tribute. Near the end of the original run of the series, we learn that his full name is Soldato J002. You know, just in case you haven't connected the dots yet. But this is an excellent example of taking what was originally a tribute to a character and then adding even more mythology on top. I can't begin to talk about these characters without first talking about the world of Silhouette Mirage. And I can't talk about the world of Silhouette Mirage without first talking about what everything in it revolves around. It's core gameplay mechanic. Treasure's Silhouette Mirage is a game all about dual attributes, where if you face one side of the screen, you shoot out blue bullets, and if you face the other side of the screen, you shoot out red bullets. Blue enemies are weak to red bullets, and vice versa. This is a gameplay mechanic that Treasure would later refine for their shoot-em-up Ikaruga. In the world of Silhouette Mirage, an apocalyptic event wiped out most of humanity and warp the survivor's attributes into either silhouette or mirage. Silhouettes, that is, the blues, are known for their physical strength and dexterity, and mirages, the reds, are known for being more intelligent and using magic. You play as Shina, an android that can use both attributes, who seeks to reset the world back to before the apocalypse. In this post-apocalyptic world rose up two leaders, Megiddo, the leader of the silhouettes, and Har, the leader of the mirages. Depending on Shina's choices, she'll either side with the lawful Har, 
the chaotic Megiddo, or neither. So you know, it's every Shin Megami Tensei plot, as written and designed by Treasure. So let's begin with the obvious one, Megiddo. Megiddo is an asshole, so we can check that one off. Calling Megiddo the leader of the silhouettes is kind of a misnomer, he doesn't do much leading at all. But dialogue with other characters in the game implies that Megiddo is very scary and dangerous. Some silhouettes look up to him, some hate him, but all of the mirages seem to fear him, claiming that he's incredibly vicious. From our point of view, he mostly just hangs out on rooftops watching our progress, and then challenges us to battle in the middle of the game to test us. When we beat him, and it's not terribly difficult, he often falls victim to his own stage hazard more than the player does. He says, Wow, you're actually pretty strong. Anyway, my twin Har is the one you're after. He's in the tower in Edo with the supercomputer. All you gotta do is go there, crack his skull open, and then hit that big reset button. But, Mr. Megiddo, why do you want to reset the world? Why, out of nothing other than the goodness of my heart, of course. Actually, the game never really explains this. Uh, it certainly isn't for the good of others. My guess is he simply doesn't want his twin to have nice things. A return to the old world implies that Har wouldn't be in charge anymore. Which reminds me, I can't really talk about Megiddo without also talking about the other side of the equation, his twin brother Har. Megiddo and Har are actually two halves of one person, Patient Zero. You see, the apocalypse was caused by human genetic experimentation, not unlike being forcibly turned into a cyborg against your will. When scientists discovered these two elements of Silhouette Mirage, they also discovered a child that had both attributes. The resulting experimentation caused the child to split into Har and Megiddo, and send that attribute shockwave around the world. Har is much more of a natural leader than Megiddo. Being a Mirage, he's incredibly intelligent, but also manipulative and cunning. Part of Har's power stems from his control of media. One of Har's minions, Delilah the Beauty, rules over Media City and broadcasts pro-Har propaganda to all. Yes, Delilah also has that nose thing going on. In fact, Har's muscle Zohar also has the pointed nose. So why do these characters all look the way that they do? Whereas the previous two of Gaita and Soldato J were likely cases of tribute, I think here it's more of a case of utility. Ultimately, Silhouette Mirage is an action game. It doesn't have a whole lot of time for text, so we need fast communication through character design. Silhouette Mirage's character designer Koichi Kimura actually gives us a lot of information through Megiddo's character design. Mysterious, pointy-headed gentleman who, when in action, looks a lot like a dart or an arrow. Kimura needed a character design that instantly communicated that this character is morally ambiguous, but likely a villain. Also, he's speedy, so put your shield up right away. And then, I don't know, he liked it so much he put it on a bunch of other characters. About halfway through the first entry of the long-running tactical RPG series Disgaea, we're introduced to a wacky trio of adventurers. The Defender of Earth Captain Gordon, his science assistant Jennifer, and her robot Thursday. Together they're a pastiche of old western science fiction serials like, you guessed it, Flash Gordon. But of course we need a tiny bit of drama, so we're introduced to Gordon's rival, Curtis. Curtis doesn't consider Gordon as being worthy of the title of Defender of Earth because tragic backstory time. Curtis's wife and daughter were killed in a terrorist attack that Gordon couldn't stop, which also left Curtis's body so heavily damaged that he made himself a new cyborg body, with weapons, and nukes. Just as Gordon is a parody of old-school Western sci-fi, Curtis is a parody of old-school Japanese sci-fi. His rocket punch move is a reference to mecha anime Mazinger Z, but everything else is Cyborg 009. He's the cybernetic scientist Dr. Gilmore, machine gun arms and sad backstory 004, and of course Accelerate Fly Guy 002 all wrapped into one, with jets striking design just to drive the point home. As if they're saying, do you get it? This is a Cyborg 009 reference. Announcer T is our only entry from outside of Japan so far. God of High School started as a Korean manhwa that's free to read in its entirety on webtoons, and is now also an animated series. He starts out as a simple background character, the announcer for a fighting tournament, but when you're charismatic and you look like this, you don't remain a background character. When the leading lady notices him at the grocery store, they have a heart-to-heart -heart about her sword fighting technique. He gives her some wisdom, being a skilled swordsman himself, and having been blinded by the same technique that she uses. I don't know what it is about this guy. Guy. Maybe it's the Kamina glasses. Maybe it's that he looks like he's always suffering from a cold. But just seeing this guy puts a smile on my face. He's shown to be a sweet and doting father and husband, but also absolutely bombastic as an announcer. I hope T lives a long and happy life. This was just a handful of admittedly kind of cherry-picked characters that have this sort of design going on. Uh, trust me, there's plenty more. And we'll get to that. But for now, let's step out of the history 
and into the mythology. So we've seen that all of these characters look extremely similar, but there's actually more than just looks that tie these characters together. Often, when using this character design, the designer also wants to convey certain themes. These themes are apparent in Japanese culture, since Cyborg 009 has been around for nearly six decades now, so the themes surrounding Jet and his lookalikes have been in the collective consciousness for a while. And honestly, that's part of the reason why I wanted to make this video, so that now us Westerners can have a sort of quick entry into the theory behind the design and the themes that come with it. So let's talk about those themes. In Western culture, the sight of a long nose will likely bring forth mental imagery of a certain dishonest puppet. Unless you're French, in which case it may also make you think of a certain poet duelist who's in a sexy love triangle with his himbo co-worker and his cousin. In Japanese culture, though, a long nose signifies arrogance, vanity, and pride. This comes from Legends of the Tengu, a bird-like creature in Japanese mythology. So just like we in the West have the story of Pinocchio with its themes of lying and honesty, Japan has its own stories and themes about this character design. So when Cyborg 009 first hit the shores of the US, a lot of us saw Jet and said, Haha, wow, this guy must have told a lot of lies. While the Japanese audience is likely saying, Wow, this guy must be pretty arrogant. And he is. And so are all of his look-alikes. So now we know why all of these long-nosed fellas are arrogant jackasses. Part of the reasoning behind Jet's design is that if he's gonna look like a bird, he may as well fly like one. Well, maybe it's actually the other way around. His flying ability may not be that impressive, considering that so many other superheroes can fly, often on top of having other more interesting powers. But you don't buy into Jet because he has the coolest power. You buy into Jet because he has the most recognizable silhouette. If you wanted the character with the coolest power, it's probably the main character of 009, who's basically the Flash. His accelerator allows him to essentially speed up his own perception of time and move very quickly. Except Jet also has an accelerator which unfortunately isn't something that's brought up very often. Jet's accelerator is actually a prototype for 009's. It can't go as fast and it has a short time limit, but to those around him, he's still moving so quickly that it looks like he's teleporting. So of course the vast majority of his lookalikes also have the ability to fly or go fast. And it's never really treated like a huge revelation in the context of the stories, it's just kind of a given. Nobody's ever really shocked. If your character looks like this, there's about an 80% chance that they're either a speedy fella or they can fly, whether that's cyborg-based, magic-based, or scarf-based. Speaking of scarves, a big part of Cyborg 009 is the iconic uniform. The red uniform with the four yellow chest buttons and arguably the most important part, the long yellow scarf. Everyone has one. The baby has one. Jet has one, even though sometimes it looks like he shouldn't. Some of his lookalikes have a similar thing going on too, whether it's also a scarf or just something that can flap heroically in the wind. Gaita has these poofy shoulder things. Megiddo has this cravat. Curtis has his long lab coat. And Soldato J has not one, not three, but two scarves. Interestingly, they also operate as his wings when he flies. But then in 2004, there was... No capes. Isn't that my decision? No capes! And since then, the scarf thing has sort of fallen out of style, at least among the lookalikes. Just like with flight and speed, it's almost always a given that these sorts of characters are cyborgs in some way or another. In fact, nearly all of them are in some way non-human, whether they're a cyborg, an alien cyborg, a fantasy cyborg, the devastating result of genetic experimentation, or an eagle monster. Sometimes it feels like they're just dropping in the cyborg thing to really drive the imagery home. It's also an easy way to add a little bit of tragedy and trauma to a character, especially if they didn't opt into it. Even though they're on the same team, it's often hinted throughout the Cyborg 009 series that Jet and the main character Joe could have easily been rivals, something that gets played out more and more as the series is rebooted. In more modern adaptations, Jet is initially hostile towards Joe until he grows to trust him and care about him enough to... Well, we'll see what happens in the next theme. Rome is Link's rival in A Link to the Past as he also seeks a way to vanquish Ganon's evil and doesn't see Link as competent enough to even be considered an ally until the penultimate chapter. Often Jay and Guy's rivalry doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially after it's revealed that they both have the same goals, but Jay just won't let go of the fact that Guy defeated him in battle several times before as pizza and continues to promise that a great duel between the two of them is coming. 
Curtis is Gordon's rival because he claims to be the true defender of Earth, since Gordon was, from Curtis's perspective at least, unable to do his job properly by protecting his family. It isn't until they share a heart-to-heart -heart that Curtis ends up changing for the better. All of this rivalry stuff leads nicely into the next theme, because what better way of wrapping up a growing character arc is there than... At some point in all of this wildness, this character design became tied to the Phoenix myth of death and resurrection. The one thing that all of these characters have in common other than the 15 degree angle on their faces is that they all die, asterisk. Duke Red starts us off with his villain gets his just desserts off screen death by robots, or death by rock in the movie. <laughs> Tragic, but not quite as memorable as, well... The original ending to Cyborg 009 saw the main character being taken to space to do battle with the big bad black ghost, and upon finishing the job, now, now gets to, to drift, drift in space until he probably, probably dies, dies maybe. maybe. But wait, here comes Jet to rescue his best friend. Except no, he's used up all of his fuel, and now he can't safely get the two of them back to the surface. Glad that at least they won't die alone, Jet asks, Joe, where do you want to fall? Before the two of them burn up in the atmosphere, becoming a shooting star. This ending caused such a stir in the 60s, the fans wrote to Ishinomori, begging him to please save 009 and 002. So he did! 001, the psychic baby, manages to teleport the two of them to safety, and the story continues from there. This case of fan-induced character resurrection is actually really touching, and shows how passionate the fans of Cyborg 009 were for its characters. And Jet's heroic self-sacrifice for just the smallest chance of saving his friend, his subsequent death by going out in a literal blaze of glory, and finally his resurrection became almost as iconic as his profile. So much so that now, like the ability to fly, it's also kind of a given that these characters go out in some blaze of glory. Rome dies in what can be interpreted as an act of self-sacrifice, but let's be real, he kind of just throws himself at Phantom Agonim, like, I'll get him, and then, yeah. Oh, but then his spirit, like, enchants an arrow that Zelda fires from his crossbow to turn it into the light arrow to slay Ganon. So it all works out. Gaeta and his whole family are quickly and brutally dispatched by Hawk King Sizer, after his two youngest siblings agree to sacrifice themselves to hold Sizer, while Gaeta and the oldest brother attack her. But then the power of Christ compels them, and they hesitate for a second, and she kills them. Later on in the series, the royal family are summoned as undead to taunt the now-good Sizer, but then they're all dispatched again. Soldato J... And that's actually kind of the end of the story. Of course, in my J video, I was being a little loose with the definition of death, but all of his near-death experiences are important to the foundation of his character. This is a guy that cannot be stopped until he's fulfilled his purpose. And J is basically the embodiment of the Phoenix myth. His j Quoth move takes on the form of a firebird, he becomes a firebird himself, and of course there's his desperation move aptly named J Phoenix. He's constantly sacrificing himself to stop someone. Remember in my last video when I said, like, the writers were like, okay, this is the last one. Spoilers, it isn't. Well, that spoilers, it isn't part has now wrapped up. It's called Hakaio, and it's a sequel to both Gao Gai Gar and Better Man. And like, the novel is already wrapped up and translated, but the manga is kind of dragging its ass. So if you care about spoilers for how Jay's story ends in Hakaio, skip ahead. He lives. He wears a tuxedo, he goes to space, and he just lives. And that's kind of a huge relief, because as you're about to see, this doesn't happen often. Also, this was a very recent development. Gal Gaigar has been going on for 25 years at this point, and it's just wrapped up. And I'm not kidding when I say that I spent the last 15 years of my life researching this. I've been keeping track of these pointy-nosed characters, and Jay's the only one that's lived. But of course he lives. He's Soldato fucking J. He spends the entire original series going, Everyone I ever knew is dead, and I need to die a warrior's death, and I will seize every available opportunity to sacrifice myself. And then he goes through this character arc that just leaves him at the end, like, You know, life is actually pretty nice. I'm gonna wear a tuxedo, celebrate my friends, and then have space adventures with my girlfriend. I didn't realize how much I actually needed that. Anyway, let's see how the others fare.
Megiddo, Har, Delilah, they all die in every single one of Silhouette Mirage's endings. Megiddo is either dispatched by the main character, reabsorbed by Armageddon itself, or shot in the back by his niece. Har is either absorbed with Megiddo into Armageddon, or into the massive supercomputer before its destruction, and Delilah receives death by... Soup. I underestimated the power of soup. Curtis, initially a villain that you fight not once but twice in the main story of Disgaea, has a change of heart and sacrifices himself to save the main characters in a fiery blaze of glory. He ends up being resurrected two chapters later as a Prinny, a penguin-like creature that serves as this universe's version of purgatory in order to atone for his sins as a human. Announcer T is murdered pretty early in the God of High School series. Just as his character was starting to get interesting, and just as I was beginning to think that he was going to be the one to escape death. Later on, he's resurrected without his memories and used as a pawn throughout the rest of the series, until he's finally Thanos snapped away towards the finale. These themes are the driving part of the ongoing mythology behind this character design. Characters with this silhouette almost seem destined to be arrogant, antagonistic, other than humans that end up growing a heart and flying too close to the sun. It's because of these recurring themes, not just the way that these characters look, but how similar all of their fates are, that have many fans considering that this character is actually part of his own larger star system, being merely an actor playing in many different unrelated pieces of media. But I like to think that this character is sort of like a trans-dimensional phoenix. When he burns out in one universe, he's reborn in another, and so the cycle continues on and on. So, where does that leave us today? Well, plenty of other tributes and parodies continue to appear, and even though they're mostly one-offs or background characters, they may not necessarily fit into the mythology, they still keep the flame alive. Also, I'm not forgetting the Cowboy Bebop character Jet Black, also a cyborg, and he has an interesting logo on his back, doesn't he? And Jet has also made it into the Pokémon universe. Like, even his name is Jet. That's literally just, like, he just tripped and fell into the Pokémon universe. Also Digimon. And actually something even more interesting has happened. The same way that Cyborg 009 was inspiring Japan back in 1979, and in turn gave us an influx of these characters, Cyborg 009 also reached the shores of the US back in the summer of 2003. Cyborg 009. And now, those of us that sat down and watched, and have become artists and character designers ourselves, are doing the same thing that Japan was doing just here in the West. Ian Jones Cordy, creator of the series OKKO, OK stated on Twitter that one of the inspirations for his pointy-headed robot character Raymond was Jet. He doesn't quite have the silhouette, but he is an arrogant fly guy, and many a fan has been looking at Steven Universe's Pearl and scratching their chin. Seth Houston, known by the Twitter handle Spectre X, has their own iteration of this design, and had this to say, Soldato J was probably my biggest exposure to the archetype, and still the most memorable to me. There's a lot to that striking profile. The sharpness and the flow of those angles. There's a flow and rhythm to the design that's not just fun to look at in action, but also really fun to draw and iterate on. For me, doing my own riff on it was partly just having fun, and partly trying to, like, capture part of a bigger idea. I was fortunate enough to get to interview one of these western birdhead creators. Polly Koberger, known by their pseudonym of Moon, is the creator of Electricopolis, an ongoing web series starring a character by the name of Bob Sparker. Let's check it out. Can you give us a quick summary of Electricopolis? Uh, Electricopolis, it's a series about an isolated city in a city of never-ending night. It's in a desert in, in a valley ringed with mountains. And the city is stratified. It's tiered like a wedding cake. The maintenance tunnels and the farms and all the, like, cogs of the town are on the bottom. And the residential, you know, lower and middle class are in the middle. And then on the up top is, you know, like, the rich 1%. The stories are primarily concerned with the folks in the entertainment industry. Because there's no place to go or no way to leave the town, the focus of the citizens largely goes inwards and they entertain themselves. The main character is a game show host with a very long nose named Bob Sparker, and uh, I believe he's the reason we're, we're yes. talking today. <laughs> I saw a, a quick clip from your Silhouette Mirage stream saying that Megiddo was a, a, a pretty big inspiration for Bob Sparker's character design. What was it about this character design that inspired you? 
I've always been really interested in characters that present in, in a very upper class way. Like Megiddo is noted in the instruction manual as looking very refined, but being actually very brutal inside. That was immediately caught my imagination. I love like the cravat and the suit and uh, of course the long nose I just find it, like, to be a really enthralling character design. I don't know what it is. It's just, it's, it's great. You know what I mean. I, I totally get you. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen whispers around the net that Bob Sparker was the inspiration for the character of Metaton, of all characters, uh, in Undertale. Is that, was that ever confirmed? Yes, actually, if you, if you go through the game or look up the credits, Bob Sparker is actually listed in the credits under the special thanks section of the game. I'm gonna have to um, go and have a look at that. That's incredible. It's... I've seen uh, a few more whispers that Bob may also be the inspiration for Spamton from Deltarune Chapter 2. It's interesting you mention that because, first of all, Toby and I are very good friends. We know each other, we, we've known each other for a very long time, and we've been influenced on each other as much as kind of me influencing him. Back when Deltarune Chapter 2 came out, I had a friend come up to me and be like, did you have anything to do with that <laughs> secret boss? And I was like, I don't... I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't played the game, what, what secret boss? But I, I did talk to Toby, and Toby uh, did confirm that the sleazy, long-pointed noseness was definitely a trait that they have in common. He, he, he was like, yeah, it's because of you that I, I, I got into those kind of character designs. So I was, I was very, very happy to hear that. How does that feel, knowing that you've been an inspiration to, to, to someone else? It's wonderful. It really means a lot to me that I can have such an indelible mark on the world. Even if it was somebody else, somebody who's, whose works weren't being performed for the Pope, uh, which I can't, I still cannot believe that. That's, that's crazy to me. I would still be very, very happy. And like the fan art I get is wonderful and beautiful. And the, the fanfics people have written about Electricopolis make me super, super happy. Because I've been a member of fandom. Niche fandom, small fandoms, but fandoms nonetheless. I've been a member of those for my entire life. And drawing fan art and writing fanfic is the way I express my love for those. And to have somebody do the same for me and or you know just to channel kind of my vibe in the form of Spamton or Metaton it's wonderful I, I can't overstate how much it means to me. I played Deltarune chapter 2 like the day it released and I'm just like feeling mighty targeted with this game right <laughs> about now and then and then Spamton just comes out of the, the dumpster. And into our hearts. <laughs> out of the dumpster and into our hearts. I don't know if you realize how wild this is. We have a directly inspired lineage from Duke Red to Jet Link to Megiddo to Bob Sparker to Spamton. Spamton! The Duke Red to Spamton pipeline. Watching the developments of this character design for the past 15 years has been exciting. The recent modernization of Jet's design, uh, particularly dropping the cartoonishly pointed nose for something a little bit more realistic, has been met with mixed reviews from fans. But seeing the concept live on in spite of this push for realism gives me hope. It's become a running gag between me and Kia. Hi, I'm Kia. Hope you like my voices. That any time I try to sit down and enjoy a piece of media, there's a good chance that I'm also going to be getting homework to add on to this topic. Excuse me. But you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm here for it. I'm glad that I can be here and watch the torch of this wacky character design continue to be passed on. I'm excited for the future to see how it takes off from here. I'd like to thank Moon for giving me the time for the interview. Uh, for my viewers, if you haven't done so already, please go read Electricopolis. You can find the link in the description. If any of these series have struck your interest, please go check them out. I've been debating with myself throughout the creation of this video whether or not I wanted to show off my own take on this character design. I mean, I wanted this mostly to be a, a history, but it's also about inspiration, so I don't know. I thought I'd just throw him in at the end here. His name is Savignon Rook. He's an arrogant jackass with a literal bullseye tattooed over his heart. Anyway, thank you for indulging me, and I hope you've been a little inspired as well. <laughs>